And now, Marvin Humphrey. Woohoo! <laughs> Thanks. It's uh, great to see so many uh, old friends here this evening. Really, you've been, have been looking forward to this presentation. Uh, as you've uh, seen in the advertisements for this, I currently work as a web developer, but I used to work in a recording studio for six years, and that is definitely going to inform the presentation from this evening. The place I worked there was uh, a recording studio in Mr. Toad's, now defunct, uh, called Mr. Toad's in, in San Francisco. Mr. Toad's Recording. Work for a guy named Tarden Feathered. Uh, so I've been really looking forward to being able to do this presentation and uh, combine my interests in sound and software. So the paper for this evening is Open Sound Control. Uh, this is a paper from 1997. The standard was actually formalized a few years later in uh, 2002. And we'll talk a bit about the distinctions between what's in the paper and what wound up in the standard. But before we do get down to the gory details of protocol design, let's talk about some of the motivations for why you would want to have something like open sound control. So the primary use case, the main thing you want to do with uh, open sound control or protocols that let you speak uh, between sound controller sound devices is that you're going to have something called a controller device and you're going to have a sound module and you'll want to send instructions from the controller device to the sound module that dictate to it what sound it should make. So think of an, an acoustic instrument. An acoustic instrument, they are all typically acoustic resonators of some kind. If you hit a drum, the head will vibrate and that will cause the air to vibrate sympathetically and sound will uh, propagate through the air. Similarly, if you strike a guitar, the front of the guitar will vibrate. Uh, if you a strike a piano key, a hammer will slam into the strings and will cause that to vibrate. Uh, but if you have a sound module, it's going to be a hunk of metal and plastic that sits in a rack somewhere. And if you strike it, it's not going to make the sound you want. If you <laughs> bow it, it's not going to help. You can't really blow through it Challenge either. You accepted. can't, yeah, you can't, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the, well, sometimes people in the recording studio would ask outlandish chains of uh, things for aesthetic reasons. And sometimes that worked when you roll the dice and they came up well. But, you know, so, so I guess the, the new challenge would be like play that uh, uh, synth module like a trumpet <coughs> and see what sound it comes out. But uh, uh, so instead, we've got these things that are controller devices. And the classical way of that is you have a keyboard that doesn't make any sound, but it sends control information over to a module that knows how to sound like a piano. And that's how you get the uh, result there. So let's now talk about what goes into bare bones uh, uh, audio synthesis, though, which is different from, say, a sampled piano. Now we're just going to start with an oscillator. And this oscillator, uh, 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 most simply, it could be a simple sine wave. Uh, uh, you can also do other waveforms, like square or whatever, square, triangle, sawtooth. Uh, now we're going to have this oscillator. We're going to plug it into a gain module. Gain is another word for volume, effectively. Uh, you would typically not just plug your oscillator into the output. There's going to be some sort of attenuation or voltage-controlled amplifier in between the two of those if you're doing this in the analog thing. Uh, and then finally, you need to have, uh, you've got the oscillator plugged into the gain, plugged into some sort of an output, which is going to go to a powered speaker of some kind. And we can do this in uh, uh, actual physical hardware, or we can model it in software, uh, where you, and what I'm going to do this evening is provide an example of that uh, using the web audio API. So we actually are doing uh, a reveal.js presentation that also involves uh, <laughs> uh, 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 the web audio API. So here's the code to make that bare bones synthesizer happen using the web audio API. You need an audio context uh, uh, that is is slightly different from browsers, which why I have that weird thing at the, at the top. Then you just, it's, and the audio context is like a window or like a, a, a canvas, if you're familiar with the HTML font, canvas uh, uh, thing. It's a container for other uh, nodes. Uh, so then we call the create oscillator function. I'm now setting the oscillator frequency to 880, which is a, it's an, an A. Uh, 
Uh, and then we have the gain, which also is created from the factory method from the audio context thing. And we're going to set the gain to 0 0.3, which sounds fairly low, but we perceive uh, amplitude logarithmically. So it's actually not that, that uh, uh, low at all. Yes? Is it 880 hertz? That's 880 hertz. That's right. Yep. The default's 440. I was originally going to do 440, but uh, I'm actually stuck. I, my the Bluetooth speaker I bought today didn't work. So you're actually going to be listening to the audio from my from my laptop, and uh, 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 and an 880 just is light, slightly louder than 440. So that's why we're doing. That's why I've changed that to, today from the demo that was uh, I sent out online. Uh, uh, then we call uh, oscillator.start. Before that, it's not putting out any signal. We connect. This is effectively plugging the oscillator into the gain node. And then I have this last thing commented out here, which is plugging the gain node into the uh, uh, audio con uh, the destination, which is effectively the, the powered out mixer output, powered speaker output. Uh, uh, but what we're going to do instead with that is I'm going to have a, uh, 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 just an HTML form button with which I'm going to turn the sound on and off. And here it is. <laughs> oh, I need to find my way over. Okay, where's my? There's the mouse. Bare bones audio synthesis. <laughs> we have an oscillator which doesn't. It only does one tone, which has no volume control. All I can do is when I it's an on mouse down event which connects it to the output and an on mouse up event which uh, disconnects it from the output. <laughs> uh, usually gain is going to be normalized from zero to one as a floating point number. That's uh, It can also be, depending on your device, it may also go from one to 11. So what does point three mean? What does point three mean? It's, uh, so it's zero, but, uh, 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 it goes from, so the scale is from zero to one and point three is going to, uh, 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 one is actually going to be maximum output for the device. And then, uh, uh, so basically multiply the signal by one uh, uh, in terms of the amplitude. Uh, uh, if, and anything lower than that is actually attenuating it effectively. Mm -hmm. So we're going to attenuate it, but only by multiplying it by point three, which still has a lot of energy. You have to get it a lot lower than that before it starts to drop away and be quiet. I actually, right now, because I, I turned it up in here, because it was originally 0.3 if I'd been going through like a Bluetooth speaker, but now it's going to be point. And I've set it to 0.8 so you could actually hear it. <laughs> Okie doke. So let's see here now. I have, ah, there, I'm going to be moving the mouse around a lot in this, I think. Okay. So now we're going to do another variant on this. It's going to be effectively the same result, but we're now going to use, instead of just directly calling the API, I've actually set it up so that we have a model of the separation between the controller device and the sound producing device. We're doing that with separate browser windows. So that uh, button up there, that's going to be the controller device. It's going to capture the physical input. And then I'm actually sending something via the window.post message API, which serializes a message, sends it to the other window, and then you have to have a uh, an event listener set up on the other window uh, uh, for a message, and then it will listen. And th then what it'll do is it'll parse that. My event listener is going to parse the message to determine if it recognizes that it should do something with it. And the message is going to be simply uh, there's two possible messages that the button is going to be sending. It's going to be slash my synth slash sound slash on, and then the corresponding uh, uh, on mouse up event will be slash my synth slash sound slash off. And uh, these things, it's a binary protocol. So uh, open sound control is, uh, as you are well aware, working with binary uh, stuff in JavaScript is uh, tray awkward. So <laughs> this is a lot uglier than it would be in uh, other languages. But effectively, this just means pack this, uh, 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 th these as 8-bit bytes, followed by some nulls, followed by a comma, followed by some nulls. And that's going to be our message. And then we have the child, which is that, and then it's going to use the post message API. Okay, so now let's see if I can make this work again. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, it's not very expressive. Uh, uh, that's about as much as I can get out of it. But nevertheless, it is an illustration of uh, basic audio synthesis. And in now, you, with the separation of the controller and the, uh, and the sound module. But there was something that was kind of ugly about that. And I'm not sure how well you could hear it from back there, but there was a click when I would put this off. And it's not just the sound of the, uh, uh, the crack pad bottoming out. It's actually what it is. It's, it's a, a sine wave waveform, which all of a sudden is no longer a sine wave. It's actually going falling straight to zero as we turn it off. And that, so what you have is basically a consistent sound frequency, which is just a single frequency. Then all of a sudden, when you have that fast transition to zero, it introduces a whole bunch of high frequency information for a very short period of time as a transient. And that produces the click. So that's an undesirable sound. Now the question is, you know, can we do something about that with OSC? Can we actually change that, that, that sound? Because that's good, you know, if we've got the problem of uh, near instantaneous transition. Well, uh, uh, what I'm gonna say is that we're, we're actually not gonna change this with OSC, not, not yet. What we're going to do is uh, 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 instead of uh, uh, in, instead of, of uh, 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 introducing a, a attack and decay change or something like that or some sort of different message, we're still going to accept these sound on and sound off messages, but we're going to interpret them slightly differently. We're going to change the sound module so that instead of being just connect and disconnect, instead it will fade up the thing to a fairly fast just enough so that it gets rid of the click. And it's basically like a very fast crossfade between nothing and then the sound. And that gets rid of the click. And this is the way it's actually done in, uh, uh, in synthesis, is that you would not have a, a sine wave which goes from nothing to zero because it always produces that ugly click. So instead, professional devices are always, we're always doing, or, and professional audio people are always doing lots of teeny tiny crossfades to uh, uh, avoid these digital clicks. So, So here's the uh, uh, new thing, and I'm not sure how well you'll be able to hear this, but there's going to be less of a click now. It's actually even less, uh, the click is not as pronounced as, uh, as it was, take my word for it. I actually found a bug, bug in Firefox, which I'm still using here, and it turns out that Firefox does this worse than either Chrome or uh, 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 Safari, that the, the, the fade-ins and fade-outs are actually uh, uh, currently a problem in Firefox. So that was a bit of agonizing debugging that I had to do. I was like, why is this working? Anyway, uh, 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 take my word for it that that's what we do. Oh, and also, uh, uh, this is my little message monitor uh, uh, for the, the sound that's coming in. You'll see that this changes from, that's the message that's arriving. So the, the three parts of an OSC message, we'll get into this a lot more later, are the address, and then we have the uh, type spec, which tells you what the arguments are going to be, and then there's going to be arguments. In this case, we have no arguments. Uh, 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 we have only the address, and is simply interpreting the uh, sound on, sound off. That's enough information for it to know what to do. So let's now think about uh, some other things uh, we could do. And if I had had enough time to program this stuff, I would have actually set up demos for all this stuff. But, but uh, uh, I'm going to just run through it. We would have gone like the four or five hour presentation if we, I had wanted to <laughs> got everything I wanted to do. Uh, uh, so let's think about some other messages we could send. So we have this thing where we're not sending any arguments on that uh, uh, sound on, sound off. But what if we change sound on, sound off to note on and note off? And then we change, uh, send in addition to uh, the on off semantics, we would send the on message with a pitch number. This is what the uh, musical instrument digital interface MIDI does. The note on messages that in MIDI are sent with a pitch number from zero to 127. Uh, uh, this is somewhat limited because uh, you only have 127 levels, uh, and that's good enough for Western music, but not for a lot of others. It's also not good for when you want to do detuning and stuff like a trumpet player would with the little slide to keep everything in tune, or acoustic, or a, yeah, a fretless bass player or something like that. Anyway, uh, uh, so 
So we could send that, and we could also send a, a, a patch change message. So I said that we would not change the that click by OSC message. We wouldn't send a, an, a, a, a parameterize the OSC message to say, on this particular note, fade up by this amount. But what we could do is actually send what we call a patch change message from the controller to the sound module or from something else to the sound module, like my laptop, which is then also communicating the sound module, is telling it how it should set itself up. And we would send that patch change message said, okay, now change all of your attacks for every note on message, tend that to be a, a 100 millisecond fade in. Change your attack to that amount. And this is another thing that you might do with the uh, open sound control protocol. You're not sending merely patch in, uh, uh, note on, note off information. You're also sending patch change information and a variety of other things. Uh, and another thing that we could be sending with, in addition to note on, note off, is something called velocity. Velocity is, uh, this is originally refers to modeling a piano keyboard in that the faster you press the keyboard down, the swifter the uh, hammer strikes the string. Uh, uh, so you can have something which fairly well models the, uh, the behavior of a piano keyboard with only velocity, pitch, and uh, uh, note on, note off. Now, it turns out that actual pianos are much more sophisticated than that and that the frequency changes, the frequency response changes, the harder you strike the strings. Uh, that, so if you take just a simple sound of the piano, of like piano being struck at some volume and turn it up, that doesn't sound the same as actually hitting the uh, thing harder. Uh, then there's also things like what we call sympathetic vibrations, where you have, when you strike two notes at the same, it's not the same as like, say, miking those two separately and then playing the other, but they will cause the interaction between those things. Uh, there's a, yeah, so piano is actually a pretty sophisticated device, even if the input from it uh, uh, can be modeled fairly simply. Uh, uh, but that's where these note on, note off, pitch and velocity, these are the fundamentals of uh, uh, musical instrument digital interface MIDI control, and they are also used by open sound control. And then let's think about some other uh, types of messages which we might send. If we're modeling, instead of a piano, say that we want to model a saxophone or a guitar, uh, where it's possible for the user to actually take a, a, a sound and then bend the tone up slightly. So the thing that's different about the this from the piano message is actually that this is continuously variable. And so you can't just say bend up by a half tone. You have to say, I'm currently bending up by some number of time, you know, of cents, which is the hundredth of a half tone. Uh, and then, uh, 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 and I'm doing this continuously. So now I'm up by 50 cents, now I'm up by 51 cents. And it turns out that you have to send a hell of a lot of messages to even model a guitar. So this is actually the, the information density of modeling a piano keyboard is quite low. It doesn't take a lot of bandwidth to do that. But once you add in pitch bend, now all of a sudden you're sending a crap ton of messages out there and you need a lot more bandwidth. There's also finally, this is another one which is the last pop, uh, popular MIDI uh, uh, message type is aftertouch. Uh, uh, and aftertouch would be say if you have a bow and you then bow harder in the middle of the stroke or if you have a wind controller and you blow harder, that is uh, 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 going to cause the tone to go mm. Uh, uh, and that's something you can't really model well with a, 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 key, a piano keyboard because a piano keyboard doesn't have that. So you need a different kind of message. Once again, this is continuously variable, so it also has the very high bandwidth requirements. Okay, well that speaks to a lot of the motivation for what we're trying to achieve with the uh, open sound control protocol. We want to, classically what we want to do is, is send expressive music, musical communication from a controlling device to a sound module. But uh, now let's talk about the actual OSC uh, uh, protocol design. So this is more the computer science section of this where we talk about what it's going to, uh, 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 how we implement and achieves those goals. So I mentioned before that the uh, uh, white paper differed slightly from the, uh, uh, the final spec that was approved in, in, uh, in 2002. One of those ways is the introduction of the OSC type tag string. That's not in the paper, uh, and it is in the final spec. Uh, I'll give, uh, uh, that's how you know what arguments are actually arriving as part of the message. And uh, the 
how that was discovered was uh, done later, or the discovery aspect of that was, uh, uh, was changed. Uh, another thing is that in that paper, there's that query system that has that whole section on request for information, exploring the address and stuff. That did not make it into the spec. It did wind up in a 2004 draft proposal, which still is around, but has never been accepted. You're welcome to uh, implement it. It's just not required in order to say, you know, I support OSC 1.0. So uh, now let's talk about some of the atomic types that are in, uh, in there. You know, we have uh, something which should be familiar to everybody, a 32-bit signed integer implemented as two's complement. Uh, we also have a, a float 32. Uh, uh, once again, this is network byte order because that was just what was done for years and years. Uh, 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 these days, you might actually use something different because little Indian processors are now you know, so much more of the market. Uh, we also have something called the, what they call an OSC time tag. I believe it uses the same protocol as NTP. I'm not sure about that. Uh, then there's something called an OSC string. Ordinarily, you would consider an, a string element to be a composite type because it's built up from characters. But in fact, you can't, you know, the OSC string is, cannot be built up, from, although there is an extended uh, character type. Uh, you can't, it's not what goes into making an OSC string. Then we also have the OSC blob, and these five are the five required uh, types for the protocol. So let's uh, just talk about what's in an OSC string. Uh, it's very similar to a, a C string in that it does not specify a length. Instead, it has a terminating null byte. Uh, unlike C strings, OSC strings are explicitly limited to ASCII values. So nothing above 127 is a valid value. Uh, and we also have this additional quirk that beyond the null byte, we're going to add zero to three more null bytes in order to get to a, a four byte boundary. So this is what, a, 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 if we were to write some C code and uh, it would have an OSC string, this is kind of what it would look like. Uh, if we add the word foo, that's three and we've got room for one more null byte and that winds up being four bytes long. So that's in, uh, uh, we end on a four byte boundary, we're all good. If we have the word food, then with the addition of the null byte, we're at five. So we need to add three more null bytes to get to the, uh, 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 the end. If we have foodie, once again, that makes it that six uh, bytes plus the seventh null byte, and we need one more null, auxiliary null to get to eight bytes. So uh, the blob is going to be similar to that. I actually am I've kind of like the blob, all the OSC strings are like C strings. Blobs are actually like Pascal strings. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Pascal strings. Uh, uh, it's not a common programming language these days. But that, uh, uh, the, back in the 1980s, that, uh, there was a war for you know, the, uh, C strings versus Pascal strings. Pascal string is a, a, a single byte indicating the length. So it can be from 0 to two, uh, uh, 255, and followed by that exactly that many bytes. It is not null terminated because you have exactly, you know how long it is based on that full byte, uh, first byte. It has a, quite a number of advantages. And primarily, you don't have to scan to the end to find out how long the damn thing is. Uh, and the OSC blob has that same characteristic. You have, you don't have to scan to the end. You couldn't because of course it contains arbitrary binary information. So the same reason you can't do Sterling on a JPEG. Uh, 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 and then, uh, uh, and so then the final thing is, like the string, it's also going to have uh, zero to three null bytes of additional padding beyond the binary content, just to end on a four byte boundary. So then we also have these additional types. Uh, I'm not really going to go into these. Uh, they are laid out in the spec, but you don't have to support them. It's just that if you do support them, you need to follow the spec because it, it explains uh, what conventions you should be adopting. So you can tunnel MIDI over OSC, sounds like. Uh, yes, you can. That's right. That's uh, uh, the MIDI, MIDI messages. MIDI is actually a spec which involves, uh, it is not merely a, 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 a file format. It also has a hardware layer. Uh, so. But MIDI messages, if you restrict it to that subset, then you can actually say, yes, a MIDI message can be tunneled over OSC. So now we're going to talk a little bit about what the motivation is for why you would actually want to have 
uh, uh, this four byte alignment? Why do we care? So here's what we call unaligned access. This is some C code here. Uh, this is a very uh, artificially created uh, uh, version uh, just to illustrate what uh, unaligned access looks like. So malloc is the C function that returns some allocated uh, uh, arbitrary memory. And uh, uh, I'm asking for what's probably going to be five bytes here. The size of an int on most platforms these days, it can be, it can vary, but it's, you know, typical platforms is four. So we're at size of int plus one is going to be five bytes. We're going to get that back. We're going to cast that to uh, uh, char star. Uh, so it's a pointer to char. Then we're going to uh, uh, take that memory and we're going to take advantage of C's uh, 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 pointer math. And go from say that this malloc returned address 16, and it's going to guarantee that there's at least five bytes which are going to be dedicated to you, starting at uh, uh, address 16. By adding one to that 16, we're going to start now on byte 17, and that's what's going to wind up in this unaligned uh, pointer to integer uh, over here. And then we're going to uh, uh, assign a number to the address starting at uh, so that's going to involve writing to bytes 17, 18, 19, and 20. Now, if it had been aligned address access, we would have been writing to uh, bytes starting at 16, 16, 17, 18, and 19. That's unaligned, you're gonna wind up with this. Now, you'll note that I put a little kaboom uh, uh, after that. And that's because on some platforms, you literally cannot do unaligned access. Uh, uh, access. It will cause the program to interrupt. I actually saw this in, uh, I wrote a CPAN module uh, back in the day that had some uh, C code and I did unaligned access on that and I sent it out and got reports back from CPAN testers that old Solaris boxes and old HP UX boxes actually would crash those tests uh, and would just crash with a bus error. So uh, these days, uh, a platform like uh, the, you know, this one is very unlikely to wind up doing this. However, it could potentially be slower. What's really going on here is that the combination of the processor and the operating system has to have slightly different behavior in order to resurrect, a, uh, in order to extract a, uh, an integer which starts on an unaligned byte and figure out what its value is. And not everybody actually provides that feature. Uh, some do, but it's going to be slow. Some don't at all, and you'll get a crash. And then some platforms like the i7 on their Mac OS, there's basically no difference at all. So my little, uh, I found that out when I tried to do a little test and then prove that I could time it and show, it's like, see, it's slower. It wasn't slower at all. And then I found out, oh, well, my laptop's the worst for that. Oh, well. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about OSC message format. Uh, there are three parts to an OSC message. We have the address, which is going to be an OSC string. We have uh, the type tag uh, information, which is going to be a, uh, also an OSC string. And then we have an arbitrary number of arguments, zero or more, at the end. Uh, so let's first talk about the addresses. So this is an example of an OSC address. Uh, one of the main things that's different from this to MIDI is that MIDI addresses are simply uh, 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 integers. So if you're trying to figure out what is connected in your, you know, what channel your MIDI de device on, you got to talk numbers. You're not going to be able to see human readable symbols. It's going to make debugging MIDI setups notoriously error prone and difficult. Uh, uh, so this is one of the motivations for this for this addressing was to actually make it much more friendly when uh, doing uh, uh, debugging and when doing setup and configuration. Uh, uh, MIDI addresses are two bytes? I've forgotten exactly what they are. Uh, uh, I think that there's, there's 16 channels. I mean, it's very dense. Uh, 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 so uh, uh, I've actually have been motivated to go and uh, now that I understand OSC, I'm going to go and like write myself a, a little a, a MIDI tool soon. But it's not many. It's not many. <laughs> That's right. You have a limited number of channels. You know, MIDI is very bandwidth constrained. It's an old format. It was designed in the late 70s and early 80s. Another constraint on OSC messages is they, they have to start with slash. Uh, it's, they are hierarchically designed. They're similar to URLs. 
Uh, they make a distinction in the uh, OSC uh, spec between the last section, they call that the method. This would be similar to the file name, or uh, if it's a file. But regardless, in OSC, this is always going to be a method at the, the last thing it's actually addressed and sent, you send a message to. And then before that, they call them containers. Uh, you know, it's the name they picked. Uh, so here we have the root container contains the uh, container A, and then A contains the container B, and then CDE is the name of the OSC method. So one thing to think about is, you know, how much do we care about that? I mean, is that actually put into practice? Well, it turns out that the main use case for this is something called pattern matching. And that's if you wanted to broadcast a message that would be received by multiple uh, uh, methods, you would use something like this. This uses Unix style globbing. Uh, and that, so that would match anything that, uh, uh, well, it's not quite Unix style globbing because it won't accept the slash, but roughly like that. You know, it turns out that there's actually pretty, uh, 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 there's pretty elaborate capabilities for the pattern matching. I kind of wonder how many people use that stuff. Uh, I mean, you can wind up with some pretty absurd results. Now think if we were actually sending out something to slash my sound slash synth slash star. That would match both on and off. So what do you mean by that? I mean, effectively, we just haven't designed this little my synth so they could actually take a pattern match. And I think that many practical devices are similarly just not going to be, it's not like, you know, you get pattern matching for free on your little API. You're just gonna wind up with just something which is completely unusable in the pattern match. But anyway, they, they, they cared about that a lot because it sure takes up a lot of space and, and uh, mind space in the spec. So that's so that's the uh, uh, the address. Now let's talk about the type tag string. Uh, 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 this says comma i i s f, and the comma is just that it, by convention it starts. It's a requirement of the spec that the comma is there. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't it isn't a placeholder for anything. It's just how you start an OSP type tag string. And then the i stands for integer, and the s stands for string, and the f stands for float, and the b stands for blob, and then you have other uh, uh, for the optional ones, they have uh, similar single letters. And when you support those, you have to make sure that you map to the right type, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so then we have the uh, uh, arguments that are specified uh, by that. The single comma, if that's the single comma is the type tag string, then it means you have no arguments. Uh, uh, and uh, one thing that's kind of interesting is that some of the optional types like true, false, and nil, you don't have a Boolean type that then has to specify a value. You actually have a true type, which occupies no space. Because the true type could only have one value. It could only be true. So why actually add an argument at the end of that? So I, I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, so uh, as we said, the, the, the type tag string was an addition in the uh, standard. The original mechanism for discovering the types uh, was to actually send messages between the controller and the sound module saying, what kind of arguments does this message take? This actually imposes a requirement for two-way communication. And although OSC does support two-way communication, unlike MIDI, uh, it does introduce complexity because most of the time you actually don't need for the controller to hear back from the, uh, 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 the sound module. In fact, in, in, uh, in MIDI, you have a cable that's one way and a lot of devices will actually have multiple things on the, on the uh, uh, DIN connectors on the back, MIDI in, MIDI out, MIDI through, etc. cetera. Uh, so if you were to actually implement this type signature technique using MIDI, you would actually need both the MIDI in and MIDI out in order to provide both uh, forward and backwards communication. So what this type signature would be a reserved method name, and it would respond back with something akin to the type tag string, which would tell you what arguments uh, the convention is there. But instead, they wound up using this type tag string, and it has the wonderful characteristic of making messages self-describing as, as far as what their arguments contain so there can be no misunderstanding even under multiple versions of, a, of, a, uh, uh, of an API as to what the message actually contains. We have another type beyond, uh, so that finishes up uh, 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 the message type. 
In addition to the message type in OSP, we have something called a bundle. Uh, and the, a bundle has three sections. It starts with uh, hashtag bundle. Uh, and the, uh, 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 that is exactly what must be there. Uh, uh, so that distinguishes it from a, uh, uh, an address because an address has to start with slash and the bundle has to start with hashtag. So then we have ask time tag is the second uh, uh, thing. And this actually is a timestamp which says this, all of these arguments together or all of these messages together, they are all dedicated to starting at exactly the same time. Uh, and then within the, uh, 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 the, the last part of a bundle is zero or more messages or bundles. Now, something which I thought was really interesting from a computer science protocol design aspect is actually that unlike the blob type, this doesn't have a link specifier. You actually have no way of knowing from the bundle itself how many arguments it has. And you can have, uh, 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 by the way, the bundle can contain uh, uh, bundles. It contains messages, can have bundles, containing bundles, containing bundles, containing bundles. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, you have no way of knowing how many there are. And the thing is that this is actually reliant upon the uh, uh, underlying uh, uh, transport layer to specify how long you should parse. So you have a UDP packet that specifies its length, and that's what you actually need to wrap something like the OSC bundle in in order to know when you should stop uh, uh, parsing that stuff. Okay, so uh, uh, once uh, a little bit more about the analysis of this protocol. So we have a, uh, uh, a requirement here that OSC, oh, that's a typo. OSC messages have to start with slash, OSC bundles have to start with the uh, hashtag. So only the uh, two first uh, two values out of 256 are uh, possibly uh, legal. So I like to think of this as akin to opcodes you would have in, say, a language interpreter, uh, like the JVM or something like that. And uh, there's a limited number of opcodes. And you know, as you add semantics to an interpreter, you want to be really parsimonious about that because you don't ever want to get above 256. Uh, now. Because that that's where you stop being able to you know extend your interpreter opcode listing. So uh, uh, with this protocol, we actually could easily extend it by adding you know all OSP messages are going to start with one of those two bytes, and we simply needed to add one more to specify a completely different kind of behavior. Now uh, uh, we could uh, uh, also. Uh, um, uh, another best practice for uh, uh, protocol design is to version your protocol. Uh, uh, effectively, we're getting something very similar. If you were to say add one more opcode, that would indicate what the, you, know, you wouldn't. It wouldn't indicate that the semantics of messages or bundles had changed. But if you got one of those, you would still know that that, that you know, one that starts with say percent, then you would know that that didn't occur in OSC 1.0. So this is just an you know, interesting way about to think about the, the importance of the first byte of these uh, communications, uh, similar to Pascal strings, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and or in terms of protocol design, it's an important uh, uh, characteristic. You know, don't just put an arbitrary thing as the first field in your. It's really good to be able to have something meaningful that indicates what there is to follow. So let's and now I wanted to emphasize once again that the, uh, all events in a bundle in a bundle are indicated as uh, 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 by the spec as occurring at exactly the same time specified by the time tag. Now this is actually very much unlike MIDI. In MIDI, if you play a chord, it's never actually a chord. The notes do not sound, sound simultaneously because MIDI is a serial protocol. And you can only deliver one note on message at a time. So that means that anytime you actually play a chord in MIDI, you're actually playing an arpeggio, just a very fast one. Uh, so MIDI is also very bandwidth constrained. You can only send so many of those note on messages. Now, if you send five, no problem. If you send 50, well, now you're getting in there where they might interfere with each other. And if you send 500, you're almost certainly going to wind up in trouble. And that's not going to sound like everything is happening simultaneously. 
So uh, uh, there are workarounds in MIDI. It typically involves adding a second wire. <laughs> uh, uh, where you are, no because the thing is, you're not going to have like 50 controller messages from one controller unless you slap the whole piano. Uh, but you might have a whole like room full of MIDI devices that are all communicating. And if you try and put that over a single pipe, it's quickly going to get saturated. So what you do is you double, you add more pipes. What's the, what's the uh, bit rate of MIDI? I think it's like 32.5 K or something like that per second, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so... Uh, uh, if all you know, like if you have 500 messages that's you know four at four bytes each, then you're going to wind up with something that's going to be some number of milliseconds before it can actually be complete, and that's so, definitely going to be you know perceptible. Like a modem from the late 80s. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. If, which is you know comparable technology because yeah. that's when these things. Were, uh, I think the MIDI protocol is like you know maybe 82 or something like that. It was uh, it was formalized. So the, uh, the problem with this extra pipe thing is actually that you need to you need to then uh, uh, synchronize what's happening in the two pipes, and it turns out that the technology to do that is something called MIDI time clock, and it's old and sucks too. <laughs> so you wind up not being able to synchronize those very well. So that's got you know the workarounds are, are are trash too. I mean, well, they weren't trash at the time; they were really the best that anybody could do. But the thing is, we've had uh, we had a hell of a lot of Moore's law since then, and. Uh, 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 you know, the technology is just capable of so much more these days. So now uh, uh, I've talked about how you wind up with, uh, 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 when you send this many, many messages, it's not going to sound the same. And now I'm going to go on a little bit more of an extended uh, uh, rant about the problems of, of, uh, of latency uh, in uh, controller, uh, in uh, sound control. Uh, so... If you have an acoustic device, as soon as you strike it, it starts resonating almost instantaneously. So there's basically zero latency between the time that you strike the strings of a keyboard, uh, uh, strike strings of piano, or uh, strike keys of piano, or the strings of guitar. It's actually not true for organs, big old pipe organs. You actually have to play in advance, and there's some like time after you strike the key uh, to press the key before it speaks. And also, large instruments such as string basses and tubas. Uh, will take a while before the entire thing gets resonating so they don't speak as quickly as small instruments like violins and trumpets. Uh, but nevertheless, you generally, with an acoustic instrument, it is going to respond pretty quickly. Uh, the, what's generally agreed is that anything more than 10 milliseconds, it's going to be perceptible by an expert. And you know, the more you have, the, uh, it's going to be more perceptible. So 10 milliseconds of latency is the maximum that's really acceptable for a round trip latency between a, uh, uh, someone who is playing a, uh, uh, a, an input device and then hearing the sound back to them. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can compensate for that as a player the same way the organist does, but it messes you up. It doesn't help. So that means that for a given component, you can have nine be okay, right? Well, the thing is that if you're uh, 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 connection between your controller and your computer takes up nine. It's not the only component in the chain. So here's the problem. A lot of times you wind up with everybody saying, eh, it's under 10 milliseconds. We're all good. That's not perceptible. But then you wind up adding nine plus nine plus nine plus nine plus nine plus nine. And all of a sudden that's a lot more than 10. And the latency of the total system winds up being very substantial. And this is a huge problem in uh, uh, synthesis, particularly with native soft synths, that the, the uh, uh, communication over the latency is very substantial. You wind up having to have specialized sound cards and specialized operating systems or external hardware where the thing that's responsible for actually producing the sound does not go through the operating system but might be configured by it. All of those are strategies to get around this aspect of that. Because, you know, think about it. The speed of sound is actually pretty bloody slow. It's about 1,000 feet or 1,200 feet per second. And if you think about that, that means that it's about one foot per millisecond. Now, if you can perceive a latency of 10 milliseconds and you're five feet away from the speaker, that's half of your latency right there. And so then if you have, not, not to mention nine milliseconds in the, in the round trip latency of all the electronics, you have five, you're already hosed. 
And the thing is that you often have a, a, a USB polling and then you have like a digital sound, uh, you have a DSP filter, which induces more delay. And then you have the digital audio converter, which induces more delay. And then you have the speed of sound from that. And you know, the thing is that this quickly winds up being much bigger problem than it is with acoustic instruments. And this is one of the major defects and major challenges of, 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 of uh, electronic instrument design today is actually producing something that can be played and is very responsive and is very tight and has very low latency. And the, the eventual aesthetic result of this is you can't do a tight groove because you can't lock it down and play so that everybody's exactly at the same time because you're always trying to anticipate by a little bit and it's just not as good as being able to know when that beat arrives. By the way, this also impacts, you know, the reason that a stadium can never clap together is because of the speed of sound. I mean, so if you're 100 yards away from somebody, that's about, you know, 250 milliseconds. If you're 1,000 feet away from somebody, it's going to be, it's, that's a, it's going to be a full second before when they clap, you clap. So that old, you know, boom, boom, psh, boom, boom, psh, there's a reason that it's not, it's not wind up being always on the beat. And it's not just that people suck at clapping. It's actually the challenge of, of, uh, of, of uh, 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 the acoustics of that. You can't have it with a large stadium. You might be able to get away with it uh, uh, with maybe a 2,000 person stadium, uh, uh, concert venue or something that's nice and intimate like a nightclub, but a large stadium is hopeless. It just can't be done. You can get it so that one receiver hears all the claps at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, so think about it. An orchestra is big enough that this matters. Uh, and that is a similar challenge. And that's one of the reasons that orchestras have such, it's such a challenge to actually get them to play as well, so like a small ensemble, as, as, to play them as, as tight as a small ensemble, because the delays from across the orchestra actually interfere. That's, you know, if the orchestra is like 75 feet, that's, you know, five, six milliseconds. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, you know, you could do that in a stadium, but it would require everybody in the stadium to anticipate <laughs> That they should be clapping at the exact moment, and uh, uh, as someone who takes great pride in in clapping on time, and you know is well aware of how difficult pe many people find that, you know, it ain't happening, man. They need, they need a strobe for the for the clapping and the stomping. Right. That'll that'll do it. <laughs> really you know, the right thing to do is to just write something like Queen did, and then then like if it's a little sloppy, it's all good. Doesn't matter. Okay, so uh, 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 let's talk a little bit about. Uh, uh, I mentioned that the uh, we've been talking about latency. So one of the nice things about MIDI is that it is a dedicated connection. Uh, uh, so you're uh, going to wind up being able to send a message and have, if you're not going to saturate the connection, you have a great deal of predictability in terms of how quickly it makes it through the wire and, and, and what the conventions are for there, because you don't have a generalized protocol like a USB that's got polling and all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, but OSC doesn't have a hardware layer. This was deliberate. Uh, they uh, did not specify that that does induce a weakness that you can't have this uh, uh, or that it doesn't require there to be a uh, a very low latency connection. But it does mean that you can send OSC over a lot of different things. And they they do talk about the uh, uh, layers you can send it over. It's typically a LAN, like you know, uh, USB or Firewire in the olden days uh, or uh, uh, or Ethernet or whatever. You can also send her over a PCI bus or the last thing that the, uh, they mentioned is just inter-process communication uh, on a computer for uh, uh, software modeled nodes. Uh, because it doesn't have a hardware layer, you could think of OSC as being not so much a, 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 a full-fledged protocol design so much as it's basically a file format that can hold information of arbitrary meaning. Uh, it's kind of like JSON. Uh, another thing that's interesting about the, oh, and, and by the way, this means that when you send OSC over MIDI, excuse me, OSC over USB, 
if you have a relatively sluggish polling interval, that you have to dial it up to the absolute maximum if you have USB 2.0. And even then, it's going to be introduce a, a delay. So this is one of the – that's why I say that the weakness of, of OSC over USB is that it introduces more latency into the system. Uh, at least you, I think they may have solved this in 3.0 because they've solved every last computer science problem in, in the, uh, uh, USB 3.0. It's just that practically in terms of it doesn't work. Uh, but the uh, – uh, but uh, so this is one of the problems of not having the dedicated layer. Uh, but they do assume a, a relatively uh, uh, high bandwidth, and this is uh, that's one of the reasons they had that was the uh, uh, the addressing scheme. Uh, the addressing scheme is expensive in order to get that uh, uh, that human readable quality. It takes a lot of require uh, space in sending the message compared to the MIDI where the semantics of the uh, uh, of who gets the, uh, the message is actually just like one or two bytes. Uh, it also imposes a requirement that you have to parse every address that shows up and that requires a lot of uh, space. The thing is that, yeah, uh, OSC was designed 15, 20 years after MIDI and th uh, there's a lot of advancement in terms of the capabilities of systems at that time. Uh, so if you're just sending something with the information density of MIDI modeling a piano, it, the overhead of parsing the message is nothing. But as you start to add continuously variable information, such as aftertouch, uh, uh, then all of a sudden the overhead starts to add up. And even if you've got an embedded device, for example, that can has enough processing power because computers are so much more powerful than they were 30 years ago, it still has battery that you might be wearing down quickly. So this is actually one of the main critiques of the OSC protocol, that not everybody is entire, uh, that does buy this lovely human readable quality, which makes configuration and debugging so much easier, but it has the downside that it is more expensive than that. Sometimes that matters. So one proposal that there's been to uh, to mitigate this is to uh, in augment OSC with a DNS-like system, where you would have uh, uh, you would conduct a uh, contact a name server that uh, would match up and tell you the actual address as an integer that corresponds to uh, the actual symbolic address. And then you no longer have to parse the, uh, uh, the, the full address. And we could actually do this by extending the protocol. We could have some uh, small, you'd have a single byte that changes at the beginning, which says the rest of these three bytes actually indicate an address uh, 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 for this. And that would be the uh, uh, convention that you would use to determine that. So OSC was definitely uh, uh, originally designed as the successor to MIDI. It was, people were very annoyed by MIDI's limitations at the time. And it was the hope that OSC would take over the world. Uh, so uh, how's that working for you? <laughs> yeah, I think you could say two things. I mean, the thing is, you know, two things are true simultaneously that uh, uh, MIDI has not been and will not be displaced. And that, but that nevertheless, OSC has its following and has been, uh, it's a successful protocol. Uh, so, uh, uh, if, you know, to cite some of the things that people with OSC are doing today, I mean, there's a certain amount of hardware support. There's a fair, it's not as, uh, as common as MIDI support because MIDI.org is a consortium of the huge manufacturers that know how to design MIDI and have been doing it for decades, they're not going to give it up. Uh, there's lots of uh, uh, there's apps and platforms. You can get you know, Osculator for your iPhone, which sends OSC messages. You can use platforms like Pure Data or Max MSP or, you know, or ways of uh, doing that. There's also, you know, people are making new YouTube videos all the time for explaining how to use OSC or what to do with OSC or solving problems with OSC. And there's also a uh, uh, an experimental control uh, uh, community. So there's a, an organization called the New Interfaces for Musical Expression that you know do 
crazy different uh, 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 ways of controlling sound. And OSC is a lot of used by a lot of them. And they hold a, uh, an annual conference. They've been doing it every year since 2001 and it's still going strong. So, uh, so with that in mind, what can be the uh, future of OSC? I think we can say, we can predict that there's gonna continue to be this development by uh, organizations, some of them, uh, it's not as centralized as MIDI, uh, but there's gonna continue to be a, a, a relatively, you know, some level of development. Uh, uh, one thing that you could say is that the current opensoundcontrol.org uh, website is, uh, shall we say, under-maintained. Uh, there's some dead links. There's some uh, 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 dated uh, uh, and, and broken uh, uh, stuff there. It'd uh, be kind of nice if whoever is responsible for that would actually turn it over to, you know, because there's obviously people who are using OSC. Uh, and you know if there ought to be volunteers uh, stepping forward to take that over. Uh, but the thing is, even if OSC is, you know, this, the people behind OSC are not as active as they were in the late 1990s, is that really a bad thing? I mean, the thing is, you have, do we need OSC 1.1? Because OSC 1.0 is pretty good. There's not really a lot that, you know, you've, it didn't have the query language. Okay. It doesn't have the DNS. Okay. But, uh, and there's some other things, there's some boutique-y things people would like to send. But the thing is that, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's now two decades old and it's not changing a lot. And one of the great things is that OSC has now moved beyond the move fast and break things stage. And so the great uh, uh, thing about this, uh, this mature stage that it's in now is that if you were to write something for the OSC platform, the OSC protocol today, it's not going to move out from underneath you. And that's uh, my presentation for this evening on the OSC protocol. Thank you very much.